Um, there's a new, a new gallery opening in Tuscola. Uh, Another one besides. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, Monticello. That's, oh, okay. They, they also belong to the vault in oh, Tuscola, okay. these friends of mine. But uh, so there's a new gallery opening in Monticello. And it's one of these kind of niche things where it's got a barber shop oh. with, you know, old timey barbers. Yeah. And there's an art gallery. So what he did is since uh, Monticello is the sages, the eagles, uh -huh. or the owls, I oh, guess, right. he painted a big owl up in the corner. And these are going to be affixed to it in the corner. So oh, it'll be there. Yeah, I thought it was really cool. Yeah. yeah to me, that, the, you know, um, having people like what I do is really, I mean, it makes me feel great. You know? mm -hmm. But when yeah. another artist buys my work for something, that makes me go like, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's fun. You know, I, do you know Joanna Drost? No, I think so. Oh, she she lives on the corner. Let's yeah. see if you, you go past the park, the state park out here. Okay. And and she lives the next corner. Okay. Um, her husband's name is Paul Locke. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, they belong to the vault. Oh, okay. She does. She does uh, orchids and stuff in the kiln. Nice. And uh, she has some nice stuff. <coughs> did they used to have a, a shop up at the, the factory or studio that did pottery? Uh, yeah, I I, think I, she, I had a I had a I think fall. she maybe was up there. Yeah, because there were two gals that had a bigger spot, and they I want to say they did pottery and and things like that, you know, fire uh -huh. products and um. Yeah, that was a neat place. I yeah, mean, that it was. was I, I was fortunate. I had a wall if, there. If, for if a while. they had just fixed the leaks in the roof, yeah, <laughs> among other things. Yeah, and yeah. you know, you think about it. Anybody that buys one of those buildings, you're going to have to replace all the windows. Oh yeah. <laughs> and that's going to that expenses. I that would run you into probably, I don't know, half a million dollars. I wouldn't windows. be surprised with all the windows that. Yeah. You, and and you wouldn't want to blow them up. Yeah. Because you need the light. Yeah. And you need a new roof, and then you know, the, the thing is that. Um, you want to protect it because there's there's good valuable timber in there. And that's a, from what I understand, it's pretty sturdy. Yeah, but it's unfortunate because those when we would have art shows, it was packed. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had oh yeah, it used to be. Now, I never sold one thing there, <laughs> but I was really honestly that was right when I started to paint. I had only been painting for about six months. Yeah, and but I mean, I did make I made two friends there who are. They were part of a traveling art show, um, and they are prolific, you know, professional artists. You know, they and I just made that contact, and they were always really, they were always really supportive, even though I knew that my work wasn't, you know, anything compared to theirs. Yeah, they were always really supportive of us. Now I'm still friends with them, and you know, yeah, it's neat. I have a hard time dealing with art folks. <laughs> I do. Yeah. yeah. You know, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, um I think we're past eleven and uh I'm sure those in the Narthex will join us shortly. Uh, I passed out a schedule. Um and so uh next Thursday we we finish up um our current study, uh, and we'll talk about church authority. Uh, there are a few other articles that we actually didn't cover. Um, the distinction of meats, um, confession again, but we did cover confession at one point. Um, and I don't know if we need to dis the st distinctions of meat. I don't know if that's something that we need to necessarily need to go over. Um, but uh, the last one we're gonna talk about is church authority. Um, that'll be next Thursday, um, and because there is a big difference between what we confess in church authority and Lutheranism and in other churches, and, and that was sort of at the, uh, a lot of issues in the Reformation as well, uh, and, um, and then I think we should be done, and so the schedule here has May 12th starting biblical numerology. Um, there isn't a book, on that, but uh, I'll provide you with the guide for our uh, study. Uh, I've been trying to post those on 
Facebook, and I've actually done that with uh, the handouts. The problem is um, uh, our church uh, Facebook page got dinged uh, a couple times for, they call it spam, we're posting spam. And I don't know how to correct that. Um, well, your Facebook page is, the Facebook page somehow, it pulls up a Nigerian page or, oh, or something yes. like that too. Oh, really? It does, because I've seen, po like, I've looked and looked for posts for faith, and it's not our church. Oh. I mean, it's our church and some other church, so you might want to. They might have the same name, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know there, um, there are a lot of uh, folks, usually from Nigeria, who like to pretend that there's something else, so I will look into that, um, and um, I think what we're going to do, though, and if anyone is I could check if somebody's watching on Facebook. Uh, we're going to start live streaming from YouTube instead of Facebook. And uh, because the church services are going to start going from YouTube instead of Facebook. Um, just because it's a streaming service, it's better quality, and uh, you don't have to have a YouTube account to watch the video. You have to have a Facebook account to watch video on Facebook. So, and some people have a real aversion to, to Facebook. Um, but yeah, so we'll go through biblical numerology, then we'll take a break uh, for, for one week, and then we'll go into um, eschatology, end times, last things. Uh, someone had mentioned that they were interested in that, so we'll talk about an introduction to it. We'll talk about the Antichrist, um, the Great Tribulation, the Millennium, the Rapture, um, and what we believe and confess and what really scripture says in regards to the things. Then we'll take another break. And then uh, I think we'll, it, would, it would probably be behoove us to talk about, um, and hopefully we can bring some other folks who might be interested in this as well, um, LGBT things, kind of discuss, discussing what that is and um, what our response to those things are in this world. Um, because it can get confusing. And, um, and it can, uh, uh, it, it does permeate every aspect of our culture. So, I mean, if you're unaware, you know, uh, if you have uh, kids or grandchildren in school, public school, it's pretty prevalent there, more than you would think. Well, you, you have to talk with your children about it because I've noticed that advertisements for products, you know, that pop up. I saw, um, I mean, an advertisement for... I don't know, a widget, whatever. Mm -hmm. And to sell it, there was a, what I assume was a biological man sitting on a bench with a lady's lavender shirt with a bow in the front, like my grandmother used to, and I was like, hey. right. <laughs> so that, no, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. I know what it's called, but I don't want to say it. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. I, got you. I know what it's called, but I just don't want to say it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Barbie had a question. I know it's just why did you break down between public schools and parochial school? Because I mean it goes on a parochial school too. Maybe not out there, but oh well, I'll tell you this at a at a parochial school. Okay, depends what kind of parochial school. Okay. But in an LCMS parochial school, you won't have teachers who are openly homosexual um, because it, it's it's not allowed. And most teachers have to be um, should be. Yeah called, called in a divine call. Um, and so, yeah, they would have to be members of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and they would have to take vows, which we'll talk about today. Um, and they are considered um, not ordained ministers, but commissioned ministers of religion. Um, so it, it does uh, it does make a difference. Um, and, and in the public school, so in a parochial school, that something like that may, you may have these kids that are there, and you may have that occurring. It's not celebrated or promoted. Uh, the public school, uh, by and large, even in our uh, small little tucked away hamlet of Sullivan, has that as well. Um, so, um, and plus it's, you know, not just in school, but the kids are interacting with this on social media, and they're getting, you know, inundated with it uh, all the time. And so we'll, we'll talk about what that is um, 
we, we may or may not live stream that so we don't get uh, <laughs> who knows we'll live stream it so we can talk right yeah 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 that's true well i don't know bring it on it would be interesting um but uh but yeah so but today we'll we'll talk about uh the second to last thing monastic vows um the handout is a little bit longer because i go through different monastic orders um and uh so just so you kind of have an uh, identity uh, or an understanding of those as well uh but um let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer Lord God, Heavenly Father, you, you bless this church with many different vocations and roles. You call us to, to love our neighbor, our closest neighbors, and you, you call us to be in, in the role and vocation of parents and grandparents and husband and wife, um, pastor and, and your uh, people of the church. Um, Lord, bless us as we talk about those roles and the vows that we take both in this life um, and, uh, and a proper understanding of how we are to be in the world, but not of it. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, yeah, monastic vows. Um, Luther was a monk, if you're unaware of that. Uh, he was an Augustinian monk. Um, his, his house, uh, you know, at the Reformation, when he uh, ceased to be a monk, Technically, is when he married um, uh, Catherine von Bora, right? Um, and uh, she was a nun too. They actually smuggled uh, nuns out of the nunneries, close the cloisters, um, and and they because they desired to be married. Um, and Luther desired to be married, so he he married Catherine, and they had several children as well. Some who died, and some who who continue to live by the Lord's grace. And so um, the house they lived in was actually his uh, monastic order house um, and uh, a very large house that he used not just to house his family, but also to uh, house people that were visiting Wittenberg and students and all sorts of things. Um, and so, um, yeah, L Luther's an Augustinian monk. He's He was a monk first. If you don't know the story of Luther, right, uh, and how he came to that, he first, when he was a young man, studied to be a lawyer. Uh, because his father desired him to be one. Um, and uh, he wasn't really into the law profession. Uh, one evening, he's uh, riding through uh, the countryside and a storm hits and lightning strikes near him. And he prays to St. Anne to save him. St. Anne is the mother of uh, uh, St. Mary, the Virgin Mary. And um, uh, he makes a vow that he would become a monk and devote his life to the church. And so he does that. He leaves, he becomes an Augustinian monk. Um, eventually he becomes uh, a priest, right? So not all monks are priests um, and not all priests are monk, but you can be a monk priest as well. Um, and he uh, eventually became a doctor in the church and a, and a professor and things like that. As he's still being um, a friar or a monk within, within the Augustinian order. Um, uh, and actually his, you know, his father in the faith, his greatest mentor in the faith was, um, Johann Staupitz, who was his, uh, head of his order, uh, for the Augustinians in, in Wittenberg. Um, and, uh, uh, we still remember him in the Lutheran church, uh, because of the influence he had on Luther. Um, but as far as I know, he never, you know, he didn't agree with the things that Luther um, and the Reformation we're trying to put across. Um, so, uh, you know, concerning monastic vows, um, it's one of these customs and traditions in the church. We talked about the, this back in, in uh, Article 15 a little bit. We talked about monks and nuns and how that comes about a, a little bit as well. Uh, but by the time the medieval theology has developed in the medieval period before the Reformation is happening and, and into the Reformation, you have this sort of um, monastic vows are obscuring the message of the gospel. They're adding to salvation, um, being viewed as a sacrament. And we'll see uh, they, they relate 
taking a vow and a religious order um, akin to baptism, cleansing you again of all your sins. Um, and there are, so you might ask, and we'll find this out later on, are there Lutheran monastic orders? Yes. Yes, there are. Um, most prominent in Europe, but again, uh, sometimes things in Europe should be viewed with skepticism or a grain of salt because they do a bunch of weird things. Uh, but there are a few monastic houses that are Lutheran here in the U.S. as well. Um, and they, you know, probably have a proper, a good understanding for the most part of what their purpose is um, and why they they uh, uh, they decide to to follow a a, a monastic way or a, a certain <laughs> adherence to a way to live. That's really what it is. Um, that's really what these different orders are about. You're saying I'm going to commit myself to these good Christian values. Um, and that that can that can be like uh, hospitality, right? Caring for people that are traveling and welcoming strangers. It can be you know renouncing wealth and being poor and focusing on caring for people and loving people that way. Um, it can be you know focusing on preaching, which we'll see these different orders did that as well. Sharing the message of the gospel, which there was a monastic order that did that. Um, but again, when you start talking about being a monk puts me in a higher order of salvation than you, the rest of the people that are lay people, um, you start to have a problem because it's not scriptural. Um, and you start to start trusting in your uh, monkery, I guess, for lack of a better term, than um, <laughs> in the holy precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So um, what are vows in scripture? There are whole, there are a number of instances where vows are being made, um, especially in the Old Testament, and there's a connection to uh, making a vow to God uh, in a ceremonial worship sense for Old Testament believers. You can see that in Leviticus 27 and Numbers 30, and even Psalm 50. Um, and so there's there's really both good and bad. Um, and in these vows that we hear of different people making them, there are uh, some being encouraged, others being condemned, um, and uh, uh, there's a different purpose behind each, each vow that's being made. You guys all made a vow, too, right? Vows are still being made in the church. You make a vow in your confirmation, um, a vow to, uh, you know, uh, defend and confess the Christian faith unto death. That's a vow, uh, you make a vow in your baptism. Sometimes your parents make it if you're very young, and sometimes you make it um, that you would, again, uh, confessing that what's happening in baptism is God is washing you clean and forgiving your sins because of Jesus in both water and word. You make a vow when you get married, um, marriage vows, right? Um, I, I made a vow as a pastor, right? Um, and uh, uh, vows are a good thing. They change who you are. They move you from one thing to something else, right? So you make a vow in marriage. I was once single. Now I'm not just myself, but a one flesh union of two people. A vow has been made. Um, you make a vow as a pastor and, and you answer uh, in this life now and on the last day before God, for the, for the caring and feeding of God's sheep. Um, and so, uh, you know, vows are important and we shouldn't think that, you know, that uh, they are just, uh, just for monks and nuns or that was something that silly people did in the medieval period or whatnot. So some examples, right? Genesis 28, Jacob vowed to serve the Lord at Bethel uh, as he <laughs> journeyed to his uncle Laban's, right? Um, uh, you have vows being made in the Old Testament in, in, uh, uh, in Judges, right, with uh, Jephthah uh, vowing to sacrifice the Lord if he would be delivered from the Ammonites, uh, their hand. You got Hannah making vows about a uh, blessing with her ch child, to be, uh, which would be given to the Lord in 1 Samuel, when you talk about the prophet Samuel. Um, even the men on the boat with Jonah made a vow um, when they threw him overboard. Um, 
And Paul makes a vow as well in Acts um, 18, um, and he cuts his hair in that regards as well. So once a vow is made, um, it was to be fulfilled. You make a vow to the Lord, and the Lord expects you uh, to follow through with it. Um, and in Scripture, though, uh, it's made voluntarily and not under compulsion. And we'll see in the medieval period, vows are being forced upon people um, against their will um, for a variety of reasons, often because uh, they're children and they're poor. It was a way to move yourself up uh, from being a peasant to something that might be more, um, or at least, at least obtain a, a more comfortable life. Um, so Deuteronomy 23 kind of talks about this vow uh, idea. Uh, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, um, and it would be sin to you. Uh, if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be a sin to you. It's voluntary. That which has gone from your lips you shall keep and perform uh, for your voluntary vow to the Lord your God that you have promised with your mouth. So um, when God speaks, things happen, right? He creates us in his image and likeness when we speak. Uh, not the same things happen as with God, but God holds our words accountable, um, so this is why in the, in the last day, right, every knee bows, every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord. Uh, this is why in the last day, every idle word will be, uh, you know, judged by the Lord. And so the Lord takes seriously the things that you say. Um, and so uh, it, it goes back to this, let your yes be yes and your no be no kind of thing that um, uh, prominent in scripture. So. Um, and so Proverbs 20 and, and Ecclesiastes 5 talks about these ideas of making a vow without thinking, um, and it's better not to make a vow at all. Um, and this goes back to the idea of trying to bargain with God. You know, God, if you just give me this one thing, I will start going to church every Sunday. Um, well, you know, often people don't follow through with those vows, but the Lord holds you to those things. <laughs> so... Uh, be careful what you say, uh, especially to, to a holy and righteous, omnipotent God. Um, so vows that can't be performed, bam, there's a sin. You're sinning against the command of the Lord. It's not pleasing, and it should be kept, right? And we talked about these pastoral vows, confirmation vows, marriage vows. They're very important. I, I think in our society now, making a vow or an oath to something is sort of not as prominent as it used to be. Um, and is kind of downplay. Um, to be honest with you, I think we have a culture of lying. Um, and and um, it, it's very prominent in the military, which I mean, may, if, I don't know if that shocks you or not, but um, this culture of, of saying things that aren't true or fabricating things is um, promoted, especially amongst army officers. So, uh, bigger brains than I, these people who write, write all these papers at the War College and um, at West Point and things like that. There was a paper that came out that uh, talked about this culture of lying that gets promoted in the military because in the military, the bureaucracy is on, you know, it's turned up to 10 compared to what normal life is like. And so in a bureaucracy, there are all these rules and things to be in compliance with. And so you as a commander of uh, a unit have this big long list of things that you have to do that's that you, in order to be in compliance with regulations, with laws, with you know policies and all these things. And it's really more than you could ever actually physically do. It's impossible to do them all. And so what they found was they had this culture of, of people, army leadership, that uh, they were fabricating these things. They call them pencil whipping, you know? Where you sort of put stuff in there that's not true, and and even I would be guilty of that. They used to do so every weekend, long weekend, the army would make you go and and uh, uh, look at your uh, vehicle. You would have to have it inspected, you know. And and again, this is part of this uh, risk averse kind of ridiculous sort of culture that's formed. So they want to see if your vehicle is uh, in. Uh, 
licensed and tagged and in has all these safety compliances you go through and you check all the safety things on your vehicle because they figure you're going to drive on a long weekend and they don't want you to be stranded or get a ticket and stuff like that so you go out there and inspect your vehicle but 95 percent of the time what what soldiers would do and i'm guilty of this would be just saying yeah i did it my vehicle's fine and we would just sign off on things and so that happens all over the place and it com compounds more and more and more and more and so um, I think that's pretty, that's a snapshot of our culture as well, where people just sort of fabricate or say things that they don't mean. Um, and uh, uh, maybe it's because there's less repercussion from it. I don't know. Um, Jesus spoke about, that's page two at the top of page two. Jesus spoke about foolish vows. He does it in Mark 7. Um, con condemning, keeping man-made commandments by neglecting the commandments of God, right? So, um, again, making a vow uh, for something that God has never commanded you to do while at the same time, you know, shirking your responsibility that God has given you. Um, and so the things we confess in Article 27, um, uh, the, the article is really long. And so what I've done is just broke it up into different sections. Um, and so we'll talk about each one of those. <laughs> Uh, the first couple lines kind of get an introduction of what's happening, and it talks about how people view monastic vows, what monastic life is like, and that being a, a monk or a nun is, uh, what about it is contrary to the word of God. So here's something to think about in the early monks, people living in solitude and all this stuff have, uh, is something that the early church did as well. And um, <laughs> What happened is, you know, uh, think about after the 300s, the church is not as heavily per persecuted anymore. It becomes, eventually becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire. Everyone in the known world becomes Christian, and um, you have people living in cities. And some of this is because of the, the country, the Roman Empire is now Christian. Everyone considers themselves Christian too, right? Because that's how you get along in this life. And... Um, uh, so you have a bunch of people that are, I guess, faking the funk, maybe, and and um, you have these folks who write, and usually they're they're uh, monks or church fathers, and they're writing that they're living in a city and their wealth, and it's they're very rich, and this lifestyle that is not that is very carnal, that's very sinful, and that's not Christian or or uh, it's very worldly, um, and so they. Uh, feel so convicted by it that they give up all of their uh, money, great wealth, they give it to the church or they give it to the poor, and then they go out and just spend a life of praying and writing and contemplating. Um, and there are a few instances of that, or they give their life to the church. I mean, you think about St. Augustine, which we'll talk about. Um, he did that. Uh, he lived a life where um, of great sin. Apparently, he was... Uh, knew quite a few women in his time before he became uh, in the church and became a Christian. And, um, and so he gets convicted of that as well. Um, another one would be um, a church father called Athanasius wrote a book called um, Anthony the Great uh, or St. Anthony the Great. He is like this forerunner for being a hermit, living out in the desert, praying, uh, but he gave up everything. Uh, his parents die. I laugh because it, he's in Alexandria. He gives up everything. He has lots of money, right? His parents die and he's tired of the city. He's tired of all this sin and all this. He wants to be true to what his God has called him to be um, in Christ. And so he, um, he gives away all his money. Uh, he takes his sister, which he's got a, which he's in charge of, gives her some money, gives her away as well. Uh, for somebody to take care of her. And he goes out into the desert. And um, uh, the book, whether it's completely true or not, um, is very interesting. He actually engages in battles with demonic forces, but he goes and lives in like a mountain by himself, you know, for a year or something like that. And then, you know, has these periods of where he's coming back and forth um, into this monastic life. And so <clears throat> eventually, those orders and those monks, they live a life, like I talked about, of, of either um, serving other people or being poor or doing this stuff, and they living in a community. Um, 
They're living in, um, in uh, isolation for a while and then coming back into, um, uh, into kind of the life of other people into a community um, or into a city and, and they go back and forth. Um, but eventually these monastic orders, these monks and, and nuns uh, develop great wealth because of the way the system of government worked in the medieval period. They owned land because they farmed for their own food. And when you owned land in the medieval period, you weren't a serf, you weren't a peasant, you actually had, that was where the wealth was at. And so, um, you know, when you had land and you could make crops and you could do all these things, you gained very wealthy. Plus we talk about, we talked about this last Thursday, when you have people that are paying you to do masses and praying for people, then you can acquire a bunch of wealth as well. And so these um, monasteries became very wealthy. Um, and and um, so it was at some point people were desiring to be a part of them. They were sending their kids away to that, which we'll see um, so that, um, you know, they can have a better life. Plus you have all this power um, and wealth and it seems kind of contrary to being a monk or a nun, right? Um, but all the monks didn't have, I mean, it's not like, a, is it a million dollars comes in and they don't divide it among all the monks. It's just like one person or two people get that money, isn't it? Well, I mean, you have like a, a community of, of people. That, there's a hierarchy, yeah. So you have folks who are like the abbots, um, who are in charge of this. Um, they have to kick some up too. Right, they have to pay a, an off, a tithe offering to the, to, the, to the diocese and to those who that they're under in their order, ultimately to the church in Rome too. That's called, that's called the bid. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't, uh, um, it's not always across the board, um, but there were monasteries that had great amount of wealth. You, you see that particularly happen in England, right? So in the English Reformation, um, Henry VIII, right? He, uh, uh, he, he was never really into the Reformation. He just wanted to have power and control over his uh, nation. He always remained Roman Catholic, right? But he wanted to break away from, we talk about next Thursday, the authority of the church, the authority of the church to own land in his kingdom and to have wealth and power outside of him. So the church wasn't paying taxes to him, they were paying it to the Pope. And so they, it was like having another kingdom inside of your own kingdom. And so in the English Reformation, breaking away from that, for him at least, it was more about exercising authority um, over his situation as opposed to rediscovering the gospel and, and reforming the church. Um, now, other people took advantage of that, and they used that. And again, the English Reformation was first and foremost a Lutheran Reformation because it, Luther sort of ignited this fire that went through there. But uh, Henry VIII seized all the monasteries um, in England um, and seized all their wealth and ransacked them. Um, and so uh, uh, th there were some that had great, great amount of wealth um, and uh, a great amount of resources such as land um, and even having land people to work that land on top of the people that were in the monastery too and it creates a great amount of power um, so not always the case not with all of them but you know um, it's interesting though in, in the medieval period you have this literature that develops with folks like Geoffrey Chaucer when he writes things like um, the Canterbury Tales and you have these discussions of friars and monks that are coming along in the in the in the in their pilgrimage down to Can Canterbury in England um, and you know you have a, a, a friar who takes a vow of poverty but is enormously fat and has uh, a great amount of wealth to spend on wine and food and things like that and a, and a mistress on the side so um, you know they're made as satire but there's truth underlying in all that uh, of things that they were observing so um, Lines three through 10, right? Talk about youth and ignorance, right? So many of those who made monastic vows, they did them when they were young or they were ignorant of what was happening, um, thinking that they, uh, uh, without the promise. So again, against scripture of not thinking through what they're making, 
Um, and, and when you're young, again, putting people in a monastic order when they're young um, uh, to provide for them because everyone is living, right? 99% of the population is living in abject poverty. Something that we probably can't even have a hard time understanding what that looks like. Because I don't even know if in the modern world, even in a third world country, you can imagine the level of poverty that people have in, in being in medieval sort of culture and, and, uh, and serfdom, right? And so um, you want your kids to have a better life that, that seems to always be the thing that parents want, right? And so you give your child over, have them tell them you're gonna make these vows to become a novice and then to become a monk. Um, and you're gonna have a much better life than us because at least you're going to be fed. You're not going to starve to death. Um, and the likelihood of you starving to death is very minimal at that point. Um, and uh, at least you'll be in a position where uh, you'll have more than what we had, which is literally nothing, you know. Um, I always think about the Monty Python and the Holy Grail where they go and they're like, the peasants are mucking, they're in the muck and they're like, what are you guys doing? You're farming muck or something like that. And, and you know, but that's really how life is. I mean, it's not, uh, I, I think it's hard for us to envision that. And so giving your kids away to a monastery, um, for one, is a better life. Two, there's a promise that comes up that, that people think if, I, if, I, if my kids become a monk, that gives me either extra grace or it assures me that they're going to be saved on the last day. Um, and again, it's obscuring the gospel um, in that. So that leads us to lines 11 through 14, right? Vows in the medieval period were considered meritorious. Um, so it shows that the Roman Catholic Church was determined, um, uh, or undermining rather, the, the work of Christ by teaching that, that, that taking a vow merited forgiveness of sin and justification before God. So uh, it's still like that in the Roman Catholic Church. When you take holy orders, right, when you become a priest or a monk, um, it's a sacrament, and they would say that it's on equal par with baptism. So you know, in baptism, your, all of your sins are forgiven. When you take vows to be a monk or to be a priest, um, uh, and you're ordained or put into these uh, holy orders, uh, your sins are cleaned again. You got another clean slate to go. And again, it goes back to that thing that we keep talking about where medieval theology in terms of grace is it's poured um uh, uh, poured into you, right? It's infused inside of you. And as you go through this life, that grace sloshes out of you like water in a bucket. And you have to keep doing things to fill it up. And so taking holy orders was considered filling that bucket of grace right back up. Um, and again, it's good works. Um that still happens even in our own circles too, by the way. I just want to point that out. There are very many, well, it's very many, but there, there are some men who go into the office of ministry who go to the seminary because they think it'll make them a better Christian. Um, and, uh, uh, or they, you know, put some kind of works righteous in the fact that they, they will be ordained or that they are ordained or that they go to seminary or whatever the case may be. Um, and that's certainly not, that's certainly just, it just works righteousness. Um, it's the same thing as monastic vows. Lines 15 and 17, right? They talked about these past advantages of the monasteries. Um, monasteries used to be a place in the early church where they taught um, scripture. Um, they made pastors and, and teachers to teach scripture as well. Um, and they were often used uh, by inscribing and copying, right? So think about this is prior to the uh, printing press to mass produce things. They, they, they were done by hand. And so uh, how do you have copies of the Bible from, you know, before the 16th century? It's done by somebody writing it out. And so that's what they would do, which is a good work and should be done in the monastery. So they're doing this painstakingly and sometimes actually with great beauty when they talk about illumination of scripture where they draw these beautiful um, artwork and calligraphy and things like that that go on there um so uh but what's happening now at least in germany too um is that um 
they're not really doing any anything, uh, teaching anything in the Bible, but instead teaching a life uh, of a monk um, to get a state of perfection or by earning God's grace. So you're not learning scripture, even though I will say that, you know, they would spend all day in these offices of praying. They would pray sometimes the, the entire psalmody, all the psalms, singing them like what we do in church as well. And um, which can you imagine singing 150 psalms in one sitting, right? I don't know if people would have the, um, <laughs> the ability to do that anymore, but, um, but they would do that. But again, not learning or um, reading and teaching the things of scripture, um, instead saying, you're a monk, let me teach you monkery or nunnery. So how to whip yourself to, to, to make yourself feel better to uh, your conscience is burdened because of sin, you know, how not to, to take a vow of silence to not say anything because, you know, that is going to make God favor you more um, than other folks. 18 through 21 talks about vows of celibacy. We talked about that in article 32. Um, we talk about the marriage of priests. Um, and so celibacy is often connected uh, with, with monastic vows. And again, it's forced celibacy um, for people, especially when those who are very young are given over to the church um, by their parents, they're forced to say in that. And forced celibacy is a... Is a in, against the command of God. Um, 23, 22 and 23, right? Vows and God's command. Um, no vow can be revoked. Uh, revoke the commands of God. Vows, uh, pretty much what they're writing in the article is that vows were contrary to what God was saying or doesn't command them in scripture, so they're not technically binding for things. Um, and then... Uh, 24 through 26 talks about these dispensations um, that certain people for their vows uh, in political situ situations, um, they, uh, they're given and released from certain things um, and allowed uh, to, to, uh, to get away with certain things because they took vows to be a monk or nun. Um, 27 through 30 is all about vows being voluntary. So stopping the forcing of people. Um, this is why Luther's wife and several other nuns have to escape uh, the cloister where the, nun are, the nuns are at because they're being forced um, into their vows and to, uh, they're not free to leave their vows. It's like being a prisoner. Um, and so uh, Article 27 is speaking against that. 31 through 35, right? Vows in their youth and marriage. Um, uh, some people were uh, taking monastic vows in the medieval period, and they were saying that that uh, it was dissolving their marriages. Um, so don't like your marriage, go become a monk or a nun. Uh, that would dissolve your marriage and uh, because that vow trumps um, your marital vows. Uh, 20, uh, 36 through, through 43, earning righteousness contrary to the gospel. Uh, I mean, again, the article is talking about all these man-made things um, in order to merit God's favor, uh, being justified by these uh, monastic vows that people are taking. Uh, 44 through 48, it's elevating the works, again, of achieving justification, um, that your life and forgiveness is one in your monastic vows, so it's condemning that. Um, uh, this is a big one, 49 through 60, it talks about the harmful results of teaching perfection. Um, so there was this understanding in medieval theology that monks and nuns could ob obtain a state of um, perfection in the commands and serving of God. And they did that because they rejected everything else in this life. Um, and so, uh, again, I don't, God never makes a promise of being perfected in this life before the last day, right? Uh, because uh, if Paul is not being perfected, um, then I, I don't know if there's much hope for us to be perfected before our Lord Jesus returns and makes all things new. Um, but it's, 
dangerous to say that only monks and nuns can become perfected in this life. So you as a normal person who just go about your day working the fields or doing your trade, um, you'll never achieve that. And so it does create a two-tiered sort of Christianity. It's very contrary to scripture. Um, and also God has given vocations most prominently. He's given the vocation of husband and wife and um, parent and child. And those are done well at the beginning of scripture, right? In the creation of things. And so um, he calls you to live out that. And if he's going to give you any perfection uh, in this life, it certainly wouldn't be rejecting those things. Um, and uh, uh, kind of hard to, to, uh, to obey the command of God to be fruitful and multiply um, when you take a vow of celibacy or you have forced celibacy. Um, so again, very contrary to God's word. Um, and then, of course, the conclusion goes, these four errors really are the prominent thing that, that the article is talking about, right? Vows to justify people before God, vows that offer perfect, uh, perfection, uh, vows that fulfill God's commands of the church, and vows are meritorious before, uh, beyond what God demands. And so we're saying in, in the Lutheran church that we reject all those things. Um, now, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? And so we talk about uh, Lutheran and monastic life. Are there Lutheran monasteries? Yeah, there are. Um, and again, there wasn't a forcing, at least in the Reformation uh, in Germany, there wasn't a forcing of people to leave the monastery by and large. It was something where you're free to do so. Um, and again, Luther is all about freedom. Um, freedom in the gospel and in Christ because he performs all those things for us. And so um, there's an example I put in here, um, Augustine House, right, which is um, in Michigan, I think. Um, and just their statement, right, you can go look at them. They're loosely associated with the ELCA, so uh, grain of salt in that. Are there any LCMS monastic houses no, I would say the closest thing you're going to find to uh, a, a Lutheran LCMS monastery is probably going to be the seminaries at Fort Wayne or at, at St. Louis. St. Louis in particular, because it's like a monastery with, with families, right? We all live in a close-knit community. We share a lot of things together. Uh, we take care of our own community. We go to you know, services every single day. Um, and, uh, um, and of course people are still fulfilling their role and vocation as parents and husband and wife and other things as well. So, um, interesting, but, uh, uh, Augustine house, uh, in their statement, right. They say, I wish that it, uh, this is the person who founded it. I wish that everyone could have uh, such a place, uh, to which to retreat periodically, <laughs> And I think that's the key there in, in, uh, in a monastic life or a monastic house. Um, so like all good friendship, rewards are greater than cost. And so having this community, this sort of place where you can go and uh, uh, refocus yourself um, is a good thing. A quiet place. Like going to be a guru or something. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, you're, you know. Um, people get burned out, they get stressed out and we go on vacation. And so sometimes it's good to remove all those things and to retrain yourself, um, in a spiritual life. Um, and so Augustine house follows the Benedictine rule. Um, they do a bunch of liturgical offices. They pray every day in different times. They have the, the Lord's supper, the Eucharist every day. Um, and so it, it's actually a place where you could go and book a retreat and go and stay um, and be a part of this environment uh, where people are praying constantly, hearing God's word and living a, a maybe a more quieter life than we than we live, you know, 
Um, and so that's good for, uh, for a time being. So let's, to wrap it up, let's just talk about each of these monastic orders. And I'll tell you, there are a few that are Lutheran um, as well. Benedictines, right? Um, founded by St. Benedict of Nursia, right? Is considered like the, the forefront of monasticism in Europe um, and is the one who came up with this way of life that monks uh, originator of it, right? Um, so there are Anglicans, uh, Lutheran, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, um, Benedictines, monks, nuns, and lay people. Uh, they have different orders um, uh, in which people subscribe to just live a way of life. Um, if you ever see them out on the street, at least the Roman Catholic ones and maybe the, the Anglican ones too, they wear black robes. They're often called the black monks. Um, Uh, so then you have the uh, Sisterkins, right? Uh, Sisericans. I can never pronounce that one. Anglicans, Roman Catholics, monks and nuns. Again, they're uh, a medieval uh, British monastic order that broke away uh, from the Benedictines um, because life was too lax, right? And so they, they even, they're more harsh. They have isolation. They do a lot of manual labor. They're called the white monks, right? They broke away from the black monks. Now they're the white monks. Um, and they wear a black scapula. You know what a scapula is? It's like this thing that comes down on the backsides. It goes over your head. Um, and they wear a white robe and, and dark collars. Um, Trappist monks, I'm sure you heard of that. They make delicious beer, uh, dark, uh, wonderful beer. Um, uh, Trappists are part of this other movement uh, of the uh, Sisterkins. Um, and uh, again, it's just another, they, they just wanted to make a little stricter from the last group. So they only eat me, uh, vegetables. Um, they communicate with each other in sign language, sorry. And uh, <laughs> that's it. Uh, they take vows of silence. Lots of vows of silence going on. And don't get me wrong, silence can be a wonderful thing. We live in a world that's lots of noise. <clears throat> I think about when I sit in my office, even when it's quiet here at church, there's still the humming of electricity coming around. So you get to a point where you remove yourself from that um, and it can be a good thing. But uh, yeah, I would, I would have a very hard time not laughing if we were all communicating with other, each other in sign language. But again, they make some delicious beer. And that beer comes from the fact when in Lent, right, they would fast. And so they would make liquid bread in order to sustain themselves. Uh, and so they would drink beer during Lent as part of their Lenten fast. Um, so every time. Yeah. What's that? There is a bread monk and he's very popular. Yeah. He goes around places and shows people how to make bread. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's, uh, um, there are wonderful, wonderful things that can be associated with, with, with monks and nuns. Carthusians, right? Uh, those are Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox. They're monks and nuns and lay, they have lay brothers, so laymen. Um, Carthusians are um, even more sort of withdrawn. Again, a medieval monk uh, monastic order that came out. Um, they only eat once a day. They wear, okay, so they wear a white tunic over everything, but they wear a, a hair shirt. That's very uncomfortable. Um, and and uh, they spend a lot of time in their, they call them cells, right? So a monastic place where you go and stay, your bedroom is a cell. And uh, they, they sort of replicate this early church idea of, in Egypt where they would go out into caves and stay for periods of time. Um, and uh, they, they don't really talk a lot. And their family members are only allowed to visit them once a year, right? There are no Luth Lutheran Car uh, Carthusians, right? Luther hated these guys <laughs> because the, he, there's a lot of writing between him and some Carthusian monks um, during the Reformation debating things. Uh, they were also spreading lies about him. Um, and so uh, I, I think those in the Augustinian order didn't really care much for Carthusians anyway. Carmelites, you may have heard of those folks before. They're Anglican and Roman Catholic. Uh, monks, nuns, and lay people. Um, I think Carmelites you most associate with nuns. Um, and uh, they usually wear brown. Sometimes they wear gray. 
and black. Um, these are probably one of those uh, medieval uh, uh, crusade origined uh, monastic orders. Um, I mean, even though they claim that they their origin is founded by the prophet Elijah um, in, in 875 BC, it's probably more like 12, uh, 1200 uh, that they come about. Um, Franciscans, that should be pretty familiar to you, right? So there are Anglican Franciscans, Lutheran Franciscans, there's a Lutheran Franciscan order in, in Germany and in Sweden. Um, and then there's a Roman Catholic, obviously. And so those are monks, a lot of nuns. Have you ever heard the Sisters of Poor, Poor Clares, right? I think they were sued uh, in Obamacare uh, for not mandating um, uh, a contraceptive or something like that. Uh, I think the government tried to destroy the poor Claire's at one point, but I think they lost, the government did. Um, and then there are lay people too. Um, and so uh, there, Francis of Assisi founded those, those folks. Uh, they were black and gray and brown and earth tones, uh, Franciscans. Um, and uh, they're a pretty prominent monastic order too. Dominicans may have heard of those guys. Uh, there's actually a lot of Dominicans in St. Louis. You can see them walking around downtown all the time. Um, they're Anglicans and Roman Catholics, monks, nuns, and lay people. St. Dominicate, Dominicate uh, he was Dominic, sorry. St. Dominic, uh, they are, they wear black. They are known as like uh, this order of preachers. They're all about preaching um, because there was a point in, in medieval church life where uh, preaching was gone. They weren't doing any <laughs> preaching during the mass, um, or people, uh, or they were just reading uh, pre-written sermons um, from other folks. And they, uh, there's this uh, revitalization of preaching that comes back. And so the Dominicans are part of that. <clears throat> they go through the countryside, um, collecting for the poor, preaching, um, and they make vows of, po of poverty, chastity, obedience, just like the rest of them really do. But they're known for their oratory skills and their debating skills. Um, you can see them in St. Louis. They wear white and black. And um, uh, Thomas Aquinas was a Dominican. And the Thomas Aquinas Institute in St. Louis um, is a place where you can actually go and get, if you're a uh, clergy to get a degree in um, preaching. I mean, it's where actually some people in St. Louis prominently go and get a master's in divinity and, and preaching, not, not just Roman Catholic, but Lutherans as well. Uh, and then Augustinians, right? Anglicans and, ours, uh, and Roman Catholics, there's no Lutheran Augustinians anymore. Monks and nuns. And again, they just follow a rule that was prescribed by St. Augustine um, but they really don't uh, find themselves being created until the 12th and 13th century. Um, so again, just other orders, they want to emphasize different things. They want to be more strict than others. Uh, it reminds me sometimes of this distinction between Amish and Mennonite and old order Amish and like, you know, some of them are more strict, some of them are other strict. Sometimes you transition to something else because maybe you want to mess with fireworks or something like that. So you become Mennonite, you know. And then the last page uh, is not a monastic order, but it might be helpful to talk about Jesuits. Exactly. Yeah, the Society of Jesus, not a monastic order, right? As far as I know, I don't think there are any Jesuit monks. There, it is a priestly order, so you can, you can be a priest and be a Jesuit. Um, uh, founded by Ignatius of Loyola, not a fan of Lutherans, right? This uh, society was created a part of the Counter-Reformation, right? They are not, they originally were not ones um, that were fans of us at all and frequently were burning us at the stake. Uh, when I say Lutherans or, or anyone who was considered Protestant. Um, and actually there's a statue, and I forget where it's at, of Ignatius of Loyola. He's, uh, he's either has a spear or he's stepping on, he's definitely stepping on Luther. Yeah, crushing him, you know, because Luther's in hell, according to them. Um, so, uh, and actually one of these, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head. It might be the Carmelites, um, St. Teresa 
uh, has a, had a vision of Luther in hell at one point too. So, um, so uh, nice guys. The Pope is, this is what the Pope is. He's a Jesuit, right? Pope Francis. Um, so uh, take- So now the Jesuits have two Popes at one time. They have the, the uh, commander of the, of the Supreme General of the Society of Jesus, mm -hmm. who is the head of the Jesuits, who they call the Black Pope. Right. And then if Francis is a, is a Jesuit too, then it's a full Jesuit. They've got all their bases covered. Well, I mean, you know, they, they got to gear up. They brought you the decimation of the pre-Columbian people and the Inquisition and all that stuff. They, I thought they were, they were the ones that were so involved in the the Inquisition. Yeah. Yes, that's part of the Counter Reformation, right? So yeah. they went through and they and and again, Inquisitions were going on all the time. But when you talk about Counter Reformation Inquisitions, um, <clears throat> a lot of those were Jesuits. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean the pre-Columbian people. Uh, um, they destroyed all their artwork and all their writings. And yeah, melted it down. Although. <laughs> Uh, too hot for TV take. I would say Cortez is. Uh, oh, he's not. I mean, he's not a religious person. No, but he was a hero, and and most of those people were. Um, I mean, I'm no fan of Jesuits, but pre-Columbian people, most of them were uh, people eating baby eaters. Oh yeah, they were worshiping serpent gods. <clears throat> yeah, they were. They were bad. Actually, I got something to share with you. Uh, um, they they do this readings of people's journals, and there's one where. Uh, a guy is with Cortez, and they talk about how Montezuma loved the delicacy of uh, child flesh. Um, and um, yeah, so anywho, uh, what ending on a positive note? Um, well, let's all go have lunch. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, uh, again, we we reject this idea of works righteousness. I don't think we necessarily reject the idea fully of of Christians going away for time periods to um, sort of reset um, or to focus their spiritual life. Um, but again, I don't think, excuse me, I don't think um, God doesn't necessarily call you uh, when he talks about living um, not of the world, but you know, you're in the world, but not of it. Um, you still have to be um, part of what he calls you to do and this mandate that goes all the way back to the created order of things, right? So, uh, it, it seems like a very easy thing, to be honest with you, even though being a monk is very hard, but it's very easy to sort of give up all of these things that may happen in your, you know, uh, you know, life as a, as a, a parent or spouse can be difficult and you say, well, I'm going to, I don't need that. I'm going to go, you know, focus on myself in the monastery. Um, that would be very selfish. Right. If you sit around all day and, and sing songs and make beautiful music. That's wonderful, but aren't you supposed to do something in the way of work? Right. And and <clears throat> we talked about this before. It creates this thing where, you know, uh, it, it creates it on both sides. You're you, you don't have to. I don't have to be a father. I don't have to be a um, a husband. I don't have to be a mother or wife. I could be a nun. I could be a monk. And I could pray all day. And it seems like the balance is off. The other side in the medieval times, it did this as well, where um, the medieval times, I'm going to say that's like the restaurant. Yeah. Uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Middle Ages, you have this uh, time in which people, normal people who are just, you know, doing, uh, living in a town as a merchant or a farmer, you know, whatever, um, they didn't, they felt like they didn't have to pray. I didn't, I don't have to do these things because the, the monastery is doing them. They're doing them for me. So I'm just going to funnel some money into them. I'll give them a cow once in a while. I'll give them a cut of my crops and let them pray for me. And I don't need to pray. And the great thing about our Lutheran faith and, the, and in the conservative reformation is that this life of prayer and these things that the church had developed early on, we talk about offices, praying offices, matins, vespers, things that we have in our hymnal, uh, Luther takes those and opens those up to people uh, to pray. So God calls you to be a farmer and a, uh, a husband and wife and a parent. And he also calls you to pray while you're doing all those things as well and reading scripture and doing that. So there's a nice balance that gets created in that. And, and it takes the responsibility. You know, you, you can't just shirk off your, um, 
your life as a Christian because of you're a farmer and you can't just shirk off your life as someone who's called to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth and live out in the world, but not of it um, as a monk. So um, it, it creates a good balance. Any questions? Okay, well, let's close with prayer. Lord God, you, you, uh, you bless us in this life by calling us into a community together. Um, and you call us to be in prayer with each other, to live out the vocations you give us, um, which are varied and can change in the season. Lord, bless us as we continue in this life, this pilgrimage in this world, not in a perfected state, but always focusing on your grace and mercy, uh, that you're forgiving our sins and on the last day will return to recreate all things and to give us a full state of perfection in you. But until that, Lord, bless us with the means by which you minister and care for us in this life. In Jesus' name, amen. I suppose you have to give these, some of the groups of monks.